110 years ago, there was a poster. It became world famous. And it was the war minister. <coughs> and the pointing finger. Your country needs you. Lord Kitchener with his big bristling moustache. And it was copied, copied by America, Uncle Sam. They had their own version. It's been done since. Your country needs you. And it was particularly just after the war, the First World War started, particularly to recruit. And remembering, of course, not everybody would be a soldier, but everybody needed to be involved in the war effort, to making sure that there would be ultimately peace, peace uh, in this country and peace for the world, a subduing of any uprising. Well, nearly 50 years later, 20th of January 1961, in his inauguration speech, it wasn't particularly long, but it was immortalised with a couple of precious phrases. And he said this, Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That was JFK. He did a lot of good in the two and two thirds years he was president. We're here in Deuteronomy chapter six, and in some ways, we are in that point in scripture where people are gathered, just like in that inauguration, in a moment of history, and a, 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 a taking of, well, we're going to say, this is a momentous, a definite moment, and we do well to realise truly what is happening here. And so Moses is drawing them together with both a, a declarational aspect, but also a pastor's heart, a loving, caring heart. And he's saying, sometimes reiterating, saying, sometimes repeating these things. But of course we all forget, don't we? We forget quickly. We do need to be told things more than once. And so that's why he's sharing things like this very, very precisely, so there be no misunderstanding. And he says this, these are the laws and decrees and the, the commands, decrees and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you, and so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. And what he's doing here is he's frequently switching between the, the you personal, your country needs you, and then the nation. So switching between the individual and the nation as a whole. So this is really effective in a spoken message to the nation in the same kind of way as, as, as John F. Kennedy, when he said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It was... It was a masterstroke in singling out the one person and yet making that one person feel part of the whole, that they, each one of us, matters. It does matter what we do. Um, and yet, of course, it matters because the whole country is made up of individuals. We all have to be together, sharing that, sharing 
that understanding, knowing what we need to do. So part of the whole nation, and yet knowing personal responsibility. And then in verse 4, we have this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He goes on down to verse 9. And then there was a few more verses singled out from later on in Deuteronomy. And another passage in Numbers. And, and those three things together are repeated by very pious Jews to this day. And they call it the Shema. S-H-E-M-A, the Shema. And that's simply based on that first word, hear. To hear. Okay? And it's re recited twice daily by pious Jews. Uh, and imagine, imagine doing that every single day, twice daily, going through these verses, um, these five verses here and, and several others. Same prayer every day, twice a day. Now it's intriguing that in Christian times, and for the last 2,000 years, apparently pious Jews, when they come to this word, sometimes when they come to the Lord is one, they repeat the word over and over again for several minutes as an attack on the belief that Jesus is God. But the problem is, with the very word they're using, is actually not about singular. It's really about unity, the coming together to be one. Listen carefully. You see, the Lord is one, so that means he's a person, not a force. Think of the force. May the force be with you, Star Wars and all that. Buddhist philosophy, we're not buying into that. We believe in the Lord being a person, a personal God. And so he's one, he can't be represented by contradictory images. And yet God is in three persons. One in three persons. And the Hebrew for one that's used here is echad. In other words, a compound unity. A compound unity as in more than one thing coming together to make the one, rather than yachid, which means absolute singularity. And here are some examples, before you take issue with me and say, Steve, you're making this up. Well, here's this word echad. It's first used in the Bible in Genesis 1 and verse 5. One day, singular, made up of evening and morning. Plurality. Okay, so that's the first use of this word echad. It actually means more than one thing coming together to make one. Another example, just in the very next chapter, famous verse, Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. That's Adam and Eve, Eve being made for Adam, and yet separate, separate until they come together in that marriage union, and that's the two becoming one. Again, this word echad, meaning a compound unity, is used there. And one more illustration of it, very, very different. Exodus 26, where we have the instructions for the tabernacle, that, that worship tent for the Israelites, for the worship of God. And there were 50 gold clasps to hold the curtains together so that that tent, that tabernacle, could be one, could be echad. You see it now? It's all coming together, yeah? And so where it says here in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, Here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This isn't for the 
people who are Jews or the people who are Muslims who give us Christians a really hard time. They're like, oh, look, yeah, the Lord's one. He's not <coughs> Holy Spirit as well. He's not Jesus as well. We say, no, actually, look at that word. That Hebrew word actually means a compound unity. And so it says there, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. All that you are. All that you are. And these commands that I give you today are to be upon your heart. So the command to love God might seem a bit, a bit strange to our ears. We're told to love? Surely it's something that I should just feel naturally and just do automatically. It's a strange thing. You might think it's a bit cold to be told to love. Why is it a command? And yet this love for God... He's only loving God in return for his love. You think back just to last week, if you were with us there, Deuteronomy 5, the Ten Commandments are given for the second time, and how do they start? Not with, you shouldn't, do not, do not, but they always start with, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In other words, the good news come fir comes first. The good stuff is there. It's saying, the Lord has been loving and giving and generous towards you. He's rescued you. He's given you what you don't deserve. He's given you what you need. And now you should love him in return by doing these things. And so many miracles for them using his power to protect and to lead them. And you might be asking, how can I have this love for God? How can I show this love for God? And it says there in verse 6, these commandments that I give you today, this is Moses speaking, are to be upon your hearts. You know, he said earlier, my lips shall praise you, my great redeemer. My heart shall worship almighty saviour our hearts need to be involved can't just do lip service how how can we do this he says this in verse 7 impress them upon your children I talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up that's pretty much all the time isn't it yeah Whatever we're doing, however busy we are, we might think, oh, I've got lots of excuses for not talking about, not thinking about the things of God. But he's saying, no, let these things be on your minds and make sure you pass them on to your children. So I'm putting it like this. A personal faith, yes. It's not just that... We're told something as a nation, like here. We're told something as a church, and we walk away and we say, okay, well, I'm broken up now, as it were, from being part of this gathering of people, so I don't really count. No, no, no. We need to have a personal faith. It needs to be you and God in, in union, knowing his power, hearing his voice, obeying. So a personal faith, yes, but, but a private faith? No. Not a private faith. I'm turning over to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, to inform us here. Matthew 22, verse Matthew 22, verse 34. <laughs> Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they are the people who don't believe in the resurrection, the Pharisees, another faction, another grouping, the Pharisees got together. 
And one of them, an expert in the law, tested him, tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, this is verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. That's fascinating, isn't it? <coughs> and maybe you've even said this yourself. Maybe you've heard it from other people. Some people say, I don't like the God of the Old Testament. I like the God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament, he's all anger and power. And we're all scared of him. And the God of the New is always gentle. Well, no, that's not true, is it? Because even if you'd never read the Bible or heard of the Bible until this morning, you can see here it's about the love of God given to people, given to undeserving sinners, and he is encouraging us, asking of us of our love in return. Love is at the heart of it, even back in the Old Testament, all the way through, all the way through from Adam and Eve onwards. He wants a fellowship with us. He wants that love relationship with us. And so here, Jesus is making it absolutely clear. It's not about just a, a solemn law-keeping, but it is about a love-keeping. Yes, you will obey those laws, but because you love, because that, that relationship, that close relationship between <coughs> you and the Lord. And so he brings those two commands together, to love your, the Lord your God and to love your neighbour as yourself from Leviticus 19 and he says all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments in other words these are the irreducible you know whatever command is given throughout the whole bible you can hang it on one of these two back in Deuteronomy 6 we're then told this tie them the Israelites were told by Moses, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now, this was to be symbolic, not literal. In Jesus' day, they'd got it into their heads that it was to be literal and they literally walked around with, with boxes with small portions of the scripture, the Hebrew scriptures tied onto their wrists and they had boxes that were extra large tied onto their foreheads and uh, uh, woven perhaps into their uh, whatever they were wearing. Now today we might say something is woven into the very fabric of our lives. You've heard that phrase, yeah? woven into the very fabric of our lives. That would be a modern equivalent. It's symbolic. It's not supposed to be literal that we tie the laws of God as symbols on our hands and bind them on our foreheads. It's another way of saying, let them never leave you. Let them be as close to you as absolutely possible. <coughs> Write them on the door frames of your houses. I mean, you can do this kind of stuff if you want to. You can have a gospel poster in your in your living room or on your window or whatever, whatever helps you. Um, but it's supposed to be even closer than that. What's at the heart of life? It is knowing that you are loved by God. By being in his word and sharing everything in prayer, loving him with all that you are. It is knowing that you are unlovely, that your sin separates you from God. But in Jesus Christ, the door to life is open 
to you. Now in verse 10 of Deuteronomy 6, there are some warnings given. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, to give you. Think of this, these are promises that have been made to people from generations back. Their ancestors, and they're going to inherit these promises. They're going to inherit the land. They're riding on the back, as it were, of others. In the same way as today, other people have worked hard that we might have this existence that we have today. But he says, when you go into that land, a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build and houses filled with all kinds of good things that you didn't provide because they've been taken over, they're cities that the Lord has given them, driving out these nations who hate God's name. Wells you didn't dig, vineyards and olive groves that you didn't plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In the Proverbs, there's a wonderful proverb, I think it's in uh, Proverbs 30, uh, verse <coughs> 6 and 7, I believe it is. Um, and it, he says this, give me neither poverty nor riches, because if I'm poor, I'd be tempted to steal and so dishonour your name. But if I'm too rich, you know what happens? If I'm wealthy and rich, oftentimes people forget about the Lord. That's the problem. That's exactly what's being warned of here in Deuteronomy. Most people, when they are wealthy, they have their security in what they can see and the money, the things that money gives them. And so we rely, we lean back in that. We say, what do we need God for? And so he says there in verse 13, fear the Lord your God, respect him, put him in his rightful place in the throne, on the throne of your life, serve him only uniquely don't serve other people don't think you can straddle two ways two paths two ideologies serve him only take your oaths in his name just promise things to him alone do not follow other gods the gods of the peoples around you for the lord your god who is among you is a jealous god and his anger will burn against you and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Take you out of this inheritance that's been looked forward towards for generations. And you're going to be the ones who are receiving it. But you could spurn that. You could lose all that by your wrong attitude, by being presumptuous on the Lord. And just or ignoring him. We're trying to two-time him, as it were, spiritually. Saying, I'll give him a bit, but not all. Do not test the Lord, your God, as you did at Massa. That's a place of grumbling, of complaining against the Lord, of doubting his promises and his purposes. So he says in verse 17, Be sure to keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, and the stipulations and decrees he has given you. Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight, so that it may go well with you. And he, you may go in and take over the good land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers, thrusting out all your enemies before you, as the Lord has said. You see, it's conditional. It's not that the Lord will forget his promise. It's not that the Lord is a bit flip-flop, two-timing, you know, and might, all might do, might not might change for mind. No, the Lord will keep to his promises, but you need to keep to your side of things as well. You need to obey and you need to own his promises and own him as Lord to have all this. In the future, 
when your son asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations and decrees and laws the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent miraculous signs and wonders, great and terrible. <coughs> There's nothing like an eyewitness, is there? Nothing like an eyewitness. I was there. People say, well, I heard from so-and-so. I heard from... But when the person arrives who says, yeah, I was there. I saw it with my eyes, my own eyes. That, that, that makes a lot of difference, doesn't it? When we see, when we hear from the person who's an eyewitness of what happened. This is what's going on here. He's saying, make the most of the fact that you are eyewitnesses. Share that with your children. They will believe you. And then you go on, you go on through the generations. And of course, it, it comes to our ears. Many, many, many generations on. We can still believe we can still believe because the Lord has kept every promise as long as man has been on earth. And so we are to give testimony, they were to give testimony of what the Lord has done. We too are the same unless we pass this on, unless we pass this on to the Lord, to um, our, our children from what the Lord has done. We cannot expect anything. But a forgotten message. You know, what do we have in our society today? We have out of our 3,000 plus people in Ogmore Vale, uh, not to mention the rest of the valley, very few people who come to church. And it's a forgotten message because we haven't really been busy sharing it and living it and living a relationship in a very public way before the Lord. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God so that we might always prosper and be kept alive as is the case today. And if we are careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. It's interesting. Righteousness. I think, well, how righteousness only comes through believing in the Lord Jesus, right? You'd say? Well, for them, it was still faith in God. It was still faith in God. If we're careful to obey all this law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. God asking them to obey him in this way. And so have a righteousness before him. They didn't know about Jesus. They weren't told that. But they knew that their salvation was in God alone. They had to believe that God was there atoning for their sin, that they might be righteous before him. There's a phrase I just want to read in, in verse 23. It says, he brought us out from there to bring us in. He brought us out to bring us in. And for every one of us who's become a Christian, he's brought us out of the world to bring us into his kingdom brought us out to bring us in and as we hear these all these different warnings which were for their good and ours we need all this we need this sure direction we need a true aim and we need god's wonderful purposes to be on our hearts as well <coughs> so please keep sharing of how good his salvation is, especially to your family. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for the love that we see from your heart to these people hearing this message for the first time from Moses' lips. Father, we pray 
and that it would not be lost on us. Thank you for your love and your care. Help us not to miss anything. But Lord, may we see ultimately that it is a relationship of love and that we are to overflow with love for you, but to obey, to share, to share with those that we love. That's the, the main way that we can show that we care is to be talking of what you have done in the past and right up to this day in our lives. Help us all to have a living testimony. Father, forgive us for the times where we do not take opportunity to live as we should. Uh, and we pray that uh, we would start afresh today, knowing what we have to do, and knowing that you can give us the power in order to do this. Thank you, Lord, for your love towards us in the Lord Jesus, and giving us the Holy Spirit, and giving us the armour of God, even giving us fellowship with each other. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.